Thank you, Kate. I'm very happy to be on your panel and give you a background of the educational process before the Great Reform. My name is William Torrey Harris, and as the superintendent of schools for St. Louis School System, I'm one of the leaders in the traditionalist movement. Before I give more of my views I would like to give a little history about America of the 19th century and how that played a part in the debate, as you may know education was basically not for the masses until the late 1800s. People were just eking out a living and would learn to read only as much as they needed to get by. If children had free time, when not working on the farm or helping the family out economically in other ways they would take in a little school. In the late 1800s a form of technology revolution happened, at that time there was a rapid advance in journalism including magazines and newspapers as well as the advancement of the railroad as a cheap and reliable form of transportation. How would that impact education, you say? Well, people were interested in hearing and reading about other parts of the country and the world and keeping up with family members who had moved. Also as with any trend or movement the economy has an important impact. By 1893, the United States was in the midst of a severe economic depression that caused concern and reflection. Our society was in a rapid state of change and it wouldn't be surprising that we would be concerned about our children and how to prepare them for a better life. With this scrutiny, a natural focus would be on education. At that time, the doctrine of education was of mental di supplying. This built on the premise that certain subjects of study had the power to strengthen skills such as memory, reasoning and imagination. The educators of that time firmly believed that the mind, as if it were a muscle and they adopted the use it or lose it philosophy, the normal routine in schools were to harshly discipline students, use monotonous drill and utilize mindless verbatim recitation. At this time only 6 to 7 percent of the high school age population of students attended school. I think we can all understand why. This type of education might have run its course if not for the poorly trained teachers of the time who were at a loss to do anything else but do this common practice. As you could see, the school system was in crisis. Children would rather work than go to school, teachers were poorly trained or had no training at all, and our country was in desperate need of a new direction. We were ready for the explosion of new ideas that were a response to this harsh form of education. The response that was really the catalyst for the great debate and the reform that has lasted to this day began quite innocently with a group of scholars working together to deal with the issue of uniform college entrance requirements. The National Education Association's Committee of Ten began working with this issue, but ultimately were drawn into the reform of secondary school curriculum by the demands of students and their parents. The immediate problem was to create a curriculum that would prepare a wide variety of students for the demands of colleges and universities throughout the country. This was a daunting challenge which ultimately had to be tackled by the best minds in our country with differing views and backgrounds. My job as an educator is to transmit the culture of Western civilization. We must preserve what has made America great by educating our children with the classics. I'm sure that you are going to hear others give differing opinions, but I'm sure posterity will prove that we were right in our views. My task is done. I have given you a basic background which brought the debate to a head.